Goedenavond allemaal. Namens Uitgeverij De Bezige Bij wil ik u hier allemaal hier in de zaal en thuis via de livestream van harte welkom heten bij de avond rondom Lea Uppies boek Vrij. Vanavond is Engels de voertaal, dus uh, daar stap ik nu ook op over. On behalf of Publishing House The Busy Bee, I would like to welcome you here in the rooms of uh, SPUI 25 as uh, via the home via the live stream to this evening in honor of Lea Uppies book Free. My name is Mariska Korti and I'm Lea's Dutch editor. When I first met Lea, I very, remember it very vividly, on Friday morning, March 13, 2020, we had just acquired translations right for her uh, beautiful, intriguing and thought-provoking book, When the World Shut Down. The afternoon before, we had heard our offices uh, would close until at least somewhere in April, but cafes were still open. Lea and I had breakfast at a completely desolate Amsterdam Central Station before she would board a train back to Berlin. Little did we know what would happen in the following months. And even though these past 18 months have been challenging or worse for most of us, the pandemic has also brought about at least one good thing, Lia Uppi's book Free. Due to her empty schedule, she was able to write the book even more uh, swiftly than she was planning on. So here we are talking about Free coming of age at the end of history. A book about the true meaning of freedom, the thin line between ideals and reality, and the similarities of being free and being suppressed. In the coming hour, Leah will be interviewed by Peter van Os, winner of the most important Dutch history prize and former resident of Albania, the country at stake tonight. And at the end, there will also be room for some questions uh, for you, from you. And as Leah's Dutch editor, I'm very proud to share her book with the Dutch reading audience. I wish you all a very pleasant and inspiring evening. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, it's true. I lived in Albania till uh, a few weeks ago. Till uh, I lived there for three years. And when I arrived, I was looking for a book like this one. Or I was actually looking for this book. <laughs> but it didn't exist yet. And there's nothing that compares to it in Albania. That's a bit odd because you would say, if you read it, it's like, wow, why didn't I read like 10 or 20 books like this? Because Albania is a special case. It's a, you are here, so you all know this, probably. Uh, the comparison, um, well, that's maybe a bit rough, but some people would say the North Korea on the Adriatic, or uh, whatever you want, but it, it was special. It was isolated. Uh, it thought of itself as, well, at least Lea thought so when she was young, that uh, Albania was the richest country in the world, and the only country where people didn't suffer, and where you had electricity and running water, and all the... Uh, the good things humanity could offer. Um, that is, of course, uh, 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 yeah, a, a given that is so wild that you would think, wow, there must have been a lot of memoirs written by Albanians, but they're not. And there are probably many reasons for that, and you can probably better say that. But I was just looking for a book like this, and I was very happy uh, when I found it in the last weeks of my <laughs> stay in Albania. Uh, read a lot of Albanian stuff, everything that's translated in some language that's, uh, in, uh, that I can read, uh, and with the help of Google Translate, uh, some books that were not translated. And I even had Albanian lessons, but hey, I'm 50 and maybe not that talented, so um, uh, I don't get much further than the supermarket. Okay, um, Lea Upi, uh, let me introduce a little bit before she will take, uh, tell you about her book, um, was a very happy, young, convinced Marxist. Uh, and then something happened, of course, uh, as you all know. And this is, in her case, is December 1990. We'll get to that. There's an, uh, we only have one hour, so, and it's, it, the book is so much fun, so we don't, have to uh, be, we don't have to be afraid for spoilers. I would think, you know, say whatever, uh, it's in, because there's so much more in the book that don't worry about it if you say something that could be regarded as a spoiler. So there's one moment, 1990, December 1990, that's important. And we, I hope we will go to 1997, which for many Albanians called the year zero. 1997. We didn't really realize that because there was also another war. Uh, there was a war going on in former Yugoslavia, and we didn't pay much attention to Albania. But it's a really, really wild story, I think. Um, and then we go to uh, today, and the end of this hour. Um, since I also have some questions about how you look at uh, the world today, which is also in your book, and it's quite uh, remarkable, I would say. <laughs> okay, first of all, to give you an impression, I hope 
uh, you uh, would like uh, you you will read from your book. Uh, it, these are the first lines, right? This, yeah, the first lines of the book, and either if you're getting tired here, here. If not, you can go until there. Okay? <laughs> it's it, for in English, right? Okay, so uh, you'll understand. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me, and uh, thank you very much, Mariska, for publishing the book in Dutch. I'm really happy to share it with the Dutch audience. I'll start reading, and then I'll ask if you want me to continue or stop. <laughs> so... So the first chapter is, the book is called Free, Coming of Age at the End of History, and it's divided in two parts. The first part is about socialism, and the second part is about liberalism. And the moment of the break is 1990, which is this moment of discovery of the society in which I lived and thinking that it wasn't what I thought it was. And the first chapter of the first part, which is about socialism, is called Stalin. So this is the, how the book starts. I never asked myself about the meaning of freedom until the day I hugged Stalin. From close up, he was much taller than I expected. Our teacher, Nora, had told us as imperialists and revisionists liked to emphasize how Stalin was a short man. He was, in fact, not as short as Louis XIV, whose height, she said, they strangely never brought up. In any case, she added gravely, focusing on appearances rather than what really mattered, was a typical imperialist mistake. Stalin was a giant, and his deeds were far more relevant than his physique. The thing that made Stalin really special, Nora went on to clarify, was that he smiled with his eyes. Can you believe it? Smiling with your eyes? That's because the friendly moustache that adorned his face covered his lips. So that if you only focused on the lips, you would never know if Stalin was really smiling or doing something else. But you just had to take one look at his eyes, piercing, intelligent, and brown, and then you knew Stalin was smiling. Do you want me to continue? Yes. <laughs> Some people were unable to look you in the eye. They clearly had something to hide. Stalin looked straight at you, and if he felt like it, or if you behaved well, his eyes would smile. He always wore an unassuming coat and plain brown shoes, and he liked to put his right hand under the left side of his coat, like this. That's not in the book. As if holding his heart. The left hand he often kept in his pocket. In his pocket? we asked. Isn't it rude to walk with your hand in your pocket? Grown-ups always tell us to take our hands out of our pockets. Well, yes, said Nora, but it's cold in the Soviet Union. <laughs> you told me to stop here, so I'm yeah, stopping. Yeah, I just, otherwise, I thought it gets... Uh, well, this is the beginning uh, of a really wonderful book. Um, uh, and here, at this moment, you're 11 years old. Uh, what happens then in your world and in your view of the world? So this is a normal school day in December 1990 in which I come out of school and I've just had a little argument with a friend of mine and I have to decide which way to walk home and different ways of walking home present different dilemmas. And so eventually I decide to resolve this dilemma by walking straight. And as I take an unusual path home, I stumble on a protest. And all I could hear are dogs barking, police shouting, and people running. And so I try to rescue myself because I get really scared of what's going on around me. And so I rescue myself. Eventually, I keep kind of run, 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 and then see in the horizon this Stalin statue. And I sort of go, and that's the only place I can think of hiding from the protests and from the police. And so I go and I hug this Stalin statue and kind of hide behind it because it's such a massive statue. And I hide behind it while I wait for the police and the dogs and the protesters to walk past. And then as they go past, I kind of, I have this memory of my school teacher, this is a moral education teacher, Nora, who tells me that Stalin had these friendly eyes and this lovely <laughs> moustache and this friendly smile that you didn't quite know whether it was a smile, but eventually you realize it really was a smile. And so I had this moment of thinking, let me look at Stalin, does he really smile or not? And so I raise my head and see that actually Stalin's head is gone. He's been decapitated. 
So the statue has lost its head. There is no eyes, no mustache, no friendly smile, no nothing. It's just gone. And so this is my moment in the book. It's the first chapter, first pages of the book, in which I think, why did they do this to Stalin? Why did they decapitate him? Who are these people? And why, what do they want? And why do they shout? Because this is the other thing I kept hearing, freedom, democracy, freedom, democracy, the sort of slogans of the protesters. And I thought, why are they shouting these slogans? Like, what does it mean, freedom? We are free. I was free. I had to decide which way to walk home. And I made a free decision. And there I am in a protest. And, um, <laughs> So that was the first moment in which I thought there was something wrong going here. And yeah, but when you came home? Uh... And, then, and then I went home and my, I talked to my parents and I say, I was hearing these dogs barking and there was a protest. And my mother says, there are no protests in this country. <laughs> All we have are hooligans. And hooligans were the way in which at school, the protesters that were beginning to mobilize against the system were being uh, despised and derided and yeah. kind of mentioned as these people who just disrupted public order. But what I did notice that day as well is how my parents were talking to each other and they were talking about protesters. And I didn't know what a protester was and what a protest was and indeed why we had any protest and what we needed protests for because we were such a great country. Why would you protest in it? But my parents were having this kind of hushing conversation. And then I kept remembering what I was told in school. And so the conflict of the whole first part of the book, really, is about the truths that you hear at school from your moral education teacher and from the Mrs. Nora. And from the state sort of, I guess, ideology and television and so on. Yeah. And then the truths that are going alongside it at home. And OK, to, to go a bit fast forward, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, then after a while, you even feel a bit betrayed by your parents. Yeah, I mean, um, they, they, they're not telling me things. And so I discovered that, you know, for example, when we studied in history books, we studied this Albanian prime minister who had the same name and surname as my father. And I know important, okay? Things. People don't know that yet. They haven't read the book yet. So you know, Lea Upi has the same name as like Mussert of Albania. Uh, uh, yeah, so the, 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 the prime minister who handed over the power to the Italians. Yeah, uh, that's to right. Say that. um, and in school, she didn't want this. They got questions about this. But she heard from her parents, he's not even related to us. Yeah. They kept saying to me, we're not related. We just have the same name and surname. But there were other things that were going on that were strange. For example, in school, all the children were commemorating the heroes of the Second World War. And they all had resistance relatives. So they would come home on the day in which we commemorated these heroes. And they would bring something, you know, a photo with an uncle that was mobilized in the resistance. And we didn't have a single person in our family. So I, kept, I was really troubled by this throughout my and, life. And you seem not to be really allowed in the class to come up with a far nephew who did keep the key or, of a mosque where some partisans were. I mean, the, the teacher felt like, Leia, you're a good girl, but... Don't make this up. Don't make this up. Because, <laughs> yeah. and we can say this, right? This, the, don't be afraid for spoilers because there's so much left in the book. This Mr. Upi was related to you. Yeah, yeah so he was my great-grandfather. and But this was only known to me in 1990 where my parents had this moment of coming out in which they told me that everything that I thought they believed. So I believed I grew up in this communist country and it was a free country. It was the, ju the most just country in the world. It wasn't that rich, but the reason it wasn't rich is that it was surrounded by all these powerful, horrible enemies. On the one hand, the American, Anglo-American imperialists, and the other hand, the social imperialists of the Soviet Union. And they were, and Yugoslavs were just on the border. And so we were attacked on all sides. And so the reason we weren't free was that even though we were a just country, we were surrounded by these horrible enemies that we had to fight before we could actually bring freedom to the whole rest of the world. So this was the kind of narrative that I believed until 1990, which my parents didn't share at all because they were a dissident family and they came from the dissident family and so they had always fought the regime and they had always... Dissident is, 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 the better word is probably enemies of the state or enemies well, yeah, of the class enemies. Well, they were class enemies, enemies class exactly. Enemies, yeah. Yeah, and because... so, so basically I had spent my entire childhood fighting class enemies until I discovered in 1990 that I was a class enemy. And so I was the enemy of myself in a way. And that's, I think that's, like I said, that's the best way of capturing this dilemma in 1990. And what was your parent, what were your parents, what were they saying to you? What was their explanation why they never told you about their past and about their biography? That's an important word in Albania. You have a good or bad biography, clean biography, dirty biography. It, it, your biography kind of like, tells you what is possible in life, where you can 
where you can go for and what you cannot. Yeah. Uh, why didn't you tell you? What was the explanation? So my parents, my parents had always mentioned this word biography and I kind of knew that my biography wasn't great because they always said our biography, they always said to me, I asked them, what is my biography like? And they always said, oh, it's as good as it gets. They never said it's fantastic, but they also never said it was horrible. So the reason they kind of said that the biography was kind of in the middle, but it turned out not to be in the middle, it was really bad, but they couldn't say this to me when I was young. Why not? Was that they felt that I could go around and tell neighbors, and tell friends that my parents were still hostile to the government and that would have put them in danger. And so there is this episode in one of the chapters of the book, which is about me making a comment about Enver Hoxha, who was the historic leader yeah. of the Albanian Communist Maybe Party. we should go there, but then buy the Coca-Cola can, because it's up there. <laughs> okay. And the Coca-Cola can ends with this... With this episode. Yes, yeah. right? You're sitting together with your neighbors right. and yeah, then... Yeah. Okay, a Coca-Cola can. This is a, a very good story and a very telling story about Albania at that time. So I hope you can explain... Uh, uh, right, so basically... In Albania, in communist Albania, we didn't have Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola was an imperialist drink, but we didn't know that it was an imperialist drink. We knew that the US was an imperialist country, but Coca-Cola, we didn't actually know what it was. So all we knew was what a Coca-Cola can was, which were cans that often tourists that came to Albania would buy in the Valuta shop. That was a shop that only sold goods to tourists. And so sometimes these tourists that came to Albania were extremely cons constrained and restricted and controlled by the government in many ways. Maybe we have a few in the room, but well, later on. Okay. Yeah, there might be people who yeah, went yeah. In, the kind of, in the 80s in Albania. Sometimes they would drop these Coca-Cola cans or, you know, someone would have access to a Coca-Cola can. And these Coca-Cola cans, because they didn't exist, they weren't sold in the Albanian shop, they were very prized possessions. And so people would often put, if they had one of them, they would put it on a bookshelf as a kind of adorning item. So every family had a Coca-Cola can on a bookshelf, like that with a flower on top of a best tablecloth that you could find to make it look even nicer. So my mom at one point in, I don't know what year it was, just before I started school, 85, I guess. Um, this was also the year in which Enver Hoxha died. Yeah. She had bought an empty Coca-Cola can from a friend at work. And she brought it home, and I remember this dilemma about the Coca-Cola can and where we put it and whether we put a flower on it or not and whether the flower would distract from the beauty of the sheer can and all of these things. So there was all this kind of long resolution. <laughs> Sorry. And they put it yeah. in the can. And then the day after, our Coca-Cola can disappears. And on the same day, it appears on the neighbor's television. Which were good friends. So these neighbors were our closest friends in the neighborhood. And the husband was a party secretary, but he was a good man who looked after my family. He had fought in the war, and he often made me play with his medals. And so he was someone who was a communist, but a kind of, of the older generation, and somehow idealistic still. And so he, they, my parents trusted them very much. They had amazing relationships. They had the key to our house. They looked after us. They helped us whenever we needed something in the neighborhood. When we had trouble with the party, my parents would go and ask him for advice on how to handle these things. And they had met in the queue, and friendships that were formed in the queue were were very important in Albania because it was a network of solidarity. You could spend hours in the queue. And anyway, so my parents would have never dreamt of accusing our neighbors of theft had it not been for this Coca-Cola can that was such a valued possession that, you know, if you have it and it suddenly disappears and then you see it on the neighbor's television, what else could it be other than your Coca-Cola can? So... My parents, my mom in particular, who was returning, and, and you know, we exchanged goods with them. We borrowed sugar and milk from the neighbors all the time. We had this kind of very strong relations of solidarity with them. But my mother went and accused the wife of stealing the can and said, this is my can. And, and the neighbor said, no, it's my can. My mom said, no, I bought it. And she said, no, I bought it. And so there was this dispute after which they fell out. The neighbors and fell out. In this out. fell out, the, the strong words were said. Like, oh, yeah, like, yeah, like you you're know. a you're, in the end, you're a bourgeois yeah, so dressed mom, as a socialist. And then, yeah. other way, you're a farmer dressed as a partisan. As a post office worker. Yeah, yeah so the old class differences yeah. resurfaced. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, so all these insults flew. And anyway, they fell out and they wouldn't talk to each other. And this made me very, very sad because I was five and a half at the time. And I spent a lot of time in their garden. We had, both of us had gardens. And I spent a lot of time on their trees and eating fruit and then he gave me his partisan cap to play with and I jumped from... Anyway, I was devastated and after a few weeks of my parents not talking to each other, I decided to kind of take the matter in my own hands and I decided to go on top of a very high fig tree that they had in their garden to pretend I was hiding so that my parents would go around to look for me 
And they, when everybody saw that there was a child missing in the neighborhood, then everyone would come together and commiserate with my parents, and they would eventually talk to each other. So this was my plan about making the neighbors talk again to each other because I was so sad because my parents had kind of said sorry, but somehow I had overheard the neighbors say that it was about their dignity and that my parents had abused their dignity and all these things that I didn't really understand what dignity was, but I remember the word and it was kind of striking. So basically, at the end of that whole day that I spent on top of the fig tree, looking down the whole neighborhood mobilizing, Eventually, the neighbor got very upset and she went and hugged my mother and said, I'm really sorry, I'm sure she'll come back, she'll be fine, and so on. And so I realized, now they made peace, so now I can come down from the tree. And so I came down from the tree with lots of scratches and being, you know, went and told everything that I had, I had thought in the tree about how my parents, I was really sad, that, and it was all a plan, and so on. So everyone was really happy, and then they had this dinner of reunion about you know, celebrating the fact that they had had this stupid division about Coca-Cola and they were talking about how this was an imperialist drink. Yeah, 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 how, how, how the West was bringing how, in Coca-Cola exactly and so. to, 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 to divide the country, yeah. which was a little bit true, uh, apparently. It was not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, because it, was, because it turned out the, re the dispute was resolved because it, it then a neighbor came in and said, I had sold the can to the neighbor at the same day in which you, so we never knew what happened to our can, but we knew that the neighbors hadn't stolen it. So the whole thing was resolved, but that same evening, which happened to be just a few months after the death of Enver Hoxha, in the final moments of reconciliation, my mom and this neighbor were talking about the fact that, you know, these Coca-Cola cans, who cares about them anyway? It's the, the yellow ones that are really good now. That, you know, a lot of people have this Coca-Cola, but they meant Fanta, but I didn't know it at the time. So it was about Fanta or Fantastic, they kept saying. And so it's actually really the Fanta cans that you should want to yeah. have. Sorry. And they were talking about this place in the, in the bookshelf that was an empty place. And I volunteered, after feeling really proud and happy with what I had done to force this reconciliation, I interfered and said, well, we were going to have a photo of Enver Hoxha on that one, but they never want any photo of Enver Hoxha there. And this was the moment where my, everybody kind of froze. So this is really stuck in my mind from like when I was five and a half because my grandmother almost dropped her plate. And I said, furthermore, after saying they didn't want... And there was, if I may say, in between, there was a history around, behind it that Lea, as a young, convinced communist, uh, very happy with the moral lessons in school, right? With the political classes of <laughs> yeah, Nora. was insisting to have a photo of Yeah, so you was always saying, why don't we have Enver Hoxha? You know, we don't, have we don't have relatives who did something brave in the Second World War. You know, uh, we don't have Enver Hoxha on the wall. Okay, get, let's at why least get Enver Hoxha. And your parents just were dismissive about yeah, well, it. Well, no, they, they, kept really... saying we have to, we, they kept saying we have to have a really nice frame and the ones that we have are not nice enough. Okay, and so they the had reason, excuses. But so then at that excuses, moment they, you said... At that moment, I was really fed up with these excuses that weren't delivering a photo for months and months, and I decided to, because I was feeling empowered by this moment of Coca-Cola yeah. reconciliation, to tell them they were going to have a photo of Enver Hoxha, but I don't think they love Enver Hoxha, actually, because they're not, if they loved him, they would definitely have a photo on the shelf. And Complete so science. this was a moment in which the kind of microphone dropped or whatever, you know, my grandmother froze and my mother was like really worried and they're looking at each other and looking at the neighbors. And this neighbor who was a party secretary, who realized the kind of gravity of the situation, said to me, come here sit on my knees, this is the most stupid thing you've ever said in your life, and you're such a stupid girl for saying this. And I remember really shaking and kind of wanting to cry, but thinking I'm a good communist, I don't want to cry, because good communists don't cry, but just feeling really kind of trembling. And, ah, sorry. and he said, yeah. and if you ever think anything stupid like this about your parents, and he said, because I also, I, I was in this moment of saying, you know, my parents were so stupid, they did this stupid thing with the Coca-Cola can, and now they did this other stupid thing with the Enver Hoxha photo, but clearly the two things weren't the same. But somehow I was kind of in this mode of accusing uh, my parents. But he and said... He said this is something that very stupid people do. Your parents are really good people. They bring you up as a good communist. They love Enver Hoxha as much as you do. And if you ever think anything's this stupid, you mustn't tell anyone ever, not even my wife. You just come to me and you only tell me. And that the was, stupid uh, things. These yeah. stupid things, yeah. And that was the end of the... So that was the moment in my childhood where I felt there's something about Enver Hoxha, something about the photo, something about my family, something about this neighbor, but I can't quite put these things together. All I know is that I was very stupid and yeah. that I mustn't do this again. Okay, I'll go fast forward again. Sorry, I can't help you. The questions are also allowed, here, but let me put this on the table so we see what time. Yeah, how much of it? A little bit fast forward. Later on, you find out the truth, right? And your parents are not who they told 
they are. Family is very important in Albania. It's important everywhere, but in Albania, it's extremely important. So you also doubt who you are, your own identity. Um, and then you kind of think, and I want to ask you about that. You kind of you start to think, well, my you you find out, sorry, that the many uh, persons in our family went to jail, to prison for a long time. Hey, grandfather, grandfather. Yeah. Grandfather. Um, so, because in Albania, well, doesn't matter why. They, they are class enemies. They should be in prison. Yeah. Uh, then you figure, when they were in prison, you're not sent to prison for nothing. Yeah. And I still notice in Albania, a lot of people have this attitude towards former political prisoners. Uh, um, there was no real opposition in Albania. It's very different from Poland, where I also lived for four years. It's very, very different. You had a huge opposition. It's called Solidarność. Can you all know about it, etc.? They could immediately take over. Uh, in your country, it wasn't like that. There were, there were people in prison, but that doesn't mean there's an opposition. Mm. So some Albanians still think about political prisoners as people, well, they must have done something wrong. Otherwise, you won't. And you, as a kid, even thought that about your family. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, Tell me why. I definitely thought that about my grandfather because. So, first of all, there was a story about how my grandfather had gone to university for a very long time and had left my father as a three-year-old. This was coded language, right? Yeah, yeah, this was coded language. So they were talking about my grandfather who had gone to university for 15 years to do research and to do translations and so on. And, then it, and so I grew up with this idea that my grandfather had been away for a very long time to do research and my dad had grown, grown up with a single mother on his own. And then it turned out that what they meant when they said my grandfather had been to university was that he had been to prison. And they told me in 1990 that this was what had happened, that he had been to prison for 15 years. But talking about freedom. So even in their own house, they had coded language. Otherwise, yeah. they were afraid you would understand this or somebody else, or, and that they would be spied upon, told about it. That yeah, it I mean, this trouble. was a very developed code language because they kept talking about this person went to study this degree and this person went to study this degree, and they t this meant different forms of... Uh, different charges. So if you studied economics, you were charged for hiding gold. And if you studied international relations, you were charged for treason. And so they had all this What kind means of very dropped out? What, what and that dropped mean? out meaning you committed suicide and staying on to study further on to become a teacher meant that you had converted into a spy. So they had a very elaborate code language, which I didn't know as a child. I didn't understand. But eventually in 1990, they broke down the code and they gave me the explanation. And part of the explanation was that my grandfather had gone to prison for 15 years. And as a child, who has never thought about political opinion and freedom and censorship, it makes no sense to you to think of a crime of consciousness. A crime of consciousness is not something that you can understand or relate to. So I remember that I was thinking, well, nobody goes to prison for nothing. He must have done something. What did he steal? Like, what did he do to people? Only thieves go to prison. And they kept saying, well, he was a political prisoner. And I was like, well, what does it mean? Well, he was, we weren't free. And I was like, but we were free. So this was the... the I guess the conflict was between what you were told at school and what you got from the state and being, bring, being brought up, shaped by state ideology on the one hand, and then the family that conceal all these things for you for the sake of protecting you from the state and for the sake of kind of protecting you from all the repercussions that revealing things like the photograph of Enver Hoxha would bring, eventually telling you this is not the truth and it's really hard to relate to that if it comes overnight to you and if they tell you from about your identity overnight. It's a bit like, I don't know, there could be all kinds of stories about identity if you're an adopted child or, you know, there may be all these moments in which the truth is revealed to you and it's really hard to grasp yeah. as it appears. And, and then you know, we move on to the 90s and then the truth seems, seems indeed to be very rough in Albania. Maybe not in the first few months, but... Let's go on to 1997, when, as an old man in Albania once told me, he said, well, we experimented with fascism, 30s, 40s. We experimented with communism, and we experimented with anarchy. And I'm waiting for democracy now. <laughs> Tell yeah. me a bit about the anarchy, because in Holland there's not so much awareness about that. What happened? Yeah, so 97 was the year in which Albanians, uh, the Albanian economy collapsed because throughout the 90s, people had made these fraudulent investments. So what they had done, basically, throughout the 90s, we were told that capitalism required saving money and investing them. And that's what people had done. They had saved money and they had invested them. And they had invested them in these companies because the financial system was very underdeveloped. You know, they had moved from having a state sector to just having all kinds of companies that promised to be banks or promised to kind of keep your savings. 
they had moved into these companies that said, you know, if you give me 30 euros this month, I'll give you 90 euros in three months' time. And then the, the returns, the promise of return kept getting higher and higher and higher. And these were Ponzi schemes. So they would kind of deliver to the first ones, and then eventually you get to the top and everybody collapses financially. So in 97, the country was basically bankrupt because the pyramid had gotten to the top. And so two-thirds of the country lost their savings, including my family, who were the last to join because they were kind of, how can we invest in these? This sounds a bit ridiculous. Where is the money coming from? And in the meantime, my mother was more liberal-minded and sort of more kind of right-wing libertarian. She tried to convince my father that we had lots of returns from the brain drain because there were remittances because a lot of Albanians had gone to Italy over the 90s and had emigrated. And so they would bring money back and the parents but were he, investing Your father money. was very reluctant, right? But my, the, the, my father was very skeptical. Yeah. But I remember these arguments in my family about should we invest or not. Yeah. And my mom was saying, well, what's there not to understand? You've got remittances. The immigrants bring money. The, the families invested in the financial companies. The financial companies give you more money. And my grandmother was saying, yeah, but what happens is everybody asks their money back. And my mom, I remember this very explicitly. She would say, well, in the West, nobody goes to ask their money bank, back from the bank. You know, if you went in the West and everybody asked their money back, of course everything would also collapse. collapse. Well. Yeah. Fair but point. You just don't do it. It's like, you know, it's kind of belief that sustains the system. So you just have to have this belief and it will sustain in the system and the system will keep going. So eventually... Well, there's a little bit, as a, as a liberal, I, I can't help myself. There's a bit of a difference that uh, Dutch, uh, Dutch, sorry, uh, Western banks try to invest the money right. in some productive companies. Well, they had companies, done, so some so of these had also done that. They had them, created yeah. clubs and restaurants. Yeah. So this was like a caricature version of yeah. what you kind of get of a capitalism. Yeah, of the West, it, okay. I, I, yeah, I buy into that. But, yeah, you know, in like within... Nine, I mean, a bit, just like the communism was a caricature of what real communism is. Yeah. So this was like the liberalism was... The, the liberal period was the same. People were having these beliefs about financial, you know, yeah. confidence and investments and return. And so they had these investments, they returned, everybody collapsed in the end. The system collapsed and everyone was really angry and wanted money from the government. And at some point they looted the assault weapons. There were lots of weapons because all Albania had done in 15 years is basically to build weapons. So there were lots of weapons scattered around in various assaults and depots and so on. So all these depots were, everybody had a weapon, a Kalashnikov more specifically. And the state had completely collapsed. It was no longer a question of left or right. It was sheer anarchy. Everyone was shooting. They were actually shooting in the air. Like, they weren't even, most of the victims, there were 2,000 deaths, more, more than 2,000 deaths. Yeah. But most of the victims were from blind bullets. So bullets that would kind of shoot in the air and then fall somewhere random and kill someone. So I remember I was doing, I was 18 and I was doing my A-levels and the school had shot. And I remember I was in this, on my bedroom, in my bedroom, it was dark, there was no electricity. I was with a candle, and all I remember was the shooting of the Kalashnikovs outside, and these bullets that would fall on my windowsill was ding, and then again, ding. And I remember talking to my grandmother about it and said, look, in the night, there's a lot of bullets. And she was like, well, just move the bed out of the window. <laughs> so, and so I was like, okay, fine, I'll move the bed out of the window. But a lot of it was also dark, so in the sense, hers was like, you will survive, you will be fine, just don't be next to the window, go a little bit further in. But a lot of it was also really scary because you couldn't actually go out because you could get killed and a lot of people were killed by these random bullets. And so. so for me, the book ends in 97 because that for me was a summary of a kind of collapsed paradigm of belief in this new liberal system that was promised to bring freedom and replace socialism. And what it brings is a lot of Kalashnikov bullets on your windowsill. So that's kind and of... Women uh, being abducted, uh, yeah, human trafficking. Yeah, sold to sex trafficking. So yeah, so all that's the... all the story of the second part of the book is about what happens to various characters that I came to contact with in the early 80s and 90s and then, you know, how... The, all the sad stories of the sort of the human victims of the way in which capitalism was brought to Albania and this kind of confidence. Before I ask if people have a question, let me uh, tell you, you go as far in the book to say that it's called freedom of vrij in Dutch. Uh, uh, that nowadays in Albania we are as far, or not in Albania, we all things are far removed from freedom as my parents mm. were. Mm. That is difficult for me to understand uh, since everything you just told about the, the dictatorship you lived in or the totalitarian mm. system mm. you lived in as a kid. Can you explain why you come to this conclusion? I mean, the book is in a way a, a tale of a failure of two systems. And in one part of the story, I am the oppressed 
And in the other part of the story, my family has had finally their revenge on the system, and so they are the privileged, they are making decisions, but there are a lot of other people who are oppressed. And so for me, and, and who you know, lose their life, or who lose their position, or who gets you know, dehumanized in many ways, and so on, so there's victims in both parts of the book. I guess the reason I say that is that for me, the way it looked in 97, and which I have kind of believed this, it's as though there was this ideology and this commitment to freedom in socialism, which I was committed to as a child, which overnight was replaced with this new commitment to liberalism and to liberal ideology, which all came, both of them had their own vocabulary, their narrative categories, their ideologies, and so on. And both of them were supposed to nurture a kind of belief in a system that would deliver eventually, but wasn't delivering now. They were in and transition. So they were in transition. So in communist Albania, in socialist Albania, it was about the transition from socialism to communism. So my true teacher communism. Nora, true communism. Yeah. yeah. So my teacher Nora would say things like, uh, in socialism, we have class war. We have the class of the proletariats who is fighting the class of the bourgeoisie, but class struggle is still there and it's still very important. In communism, class struggle disappears and the state withers away because that is the real utopia. So now we are in this transition from socialist freedom to communist freedom. And then in the 90s, communist freedom was gone, communism was gone, the working classes were gone, all the categories that you used to make sense of this transition to communism were gone, and they were replaced by this new discourse of liberalizing, structural reform, uh, invest and save, shock therapy, political freedom, and the one thing that you were not, and we had lots of parties, so we, we, you know, we, we had freedom of opinion and freedom of thought and freedom of expression, so we had like 300 different parties, but the one thing that these 300 different parties were not doing, and were actually, it wasn't really acceptable that they would do, was to question the liberal system in which they lived. And nobody in Albania actually ever questions this new reality in which we're in, because there is still this utopia that liberalism will eventually deliver. It's not working now, we know it's not quite working. There are some people, they're losing their jobs. Some other people are forced to leave their country. Perhaps Life yeah. is miserable for quite a few of them. It's going to be miserable for a few more years. But if you adapt and you make these sacrifices, this liberal utopia will deliver. Because what else is there apart from that utopia? Yeah, and maybe nowadays even, uh, sorry if I may, uh, uh, the, the Europe. So, uh, right. I, yeah, I talked to some people working on the countryside that were helping a friend with building a house. That's right. And they, they said... Yeah, the EU, uh, Albania wants to join the EU, right? That's a big issue in Albanian politics, how to do that. And the EU, especially Holland, says, well, you're not ready for it. You have to do a right. few more things exactly. here and there, uh, a rule of law. And, uh, and uh, so these workers said to me, well, to be fair, it was a bit different. My wife was there too, and she was a diplomat for Holland. So the Albanian friend was asking the workers, why are you all so silent? You normally talk so much. Oh, we don't want to start a diplomatic row. <laughs> okay, but, okay. well, then give your political opinions. And they said, well, yeah, opinions, opinions, a bit complicated. It reminds us of the time of communism. We were waiting all the time for the true communism to arrive. And now we're waiting all the time for the true Europe to arrive. Exactly. Well, and, and apparently that's also an utopian idea. If we're yeah. part of Europe, totally. then things go by itself. You can go fish in the morning and exactly. I don't know what Mark yeah, said no, about totally. it. Yeah, totally. Hunt in the <laughs> afternoon, criticize yeah. in the evening. Definitely. So, that's, so, so you know, you, to answer your question, why do you have this thing about this, both these systems failing? Because in the meantime, lives are gone by. Some of them are lost. You know, some people yeah. die on the workplace. Some people died doing these dangerous crossings, trying to go to Italy. Yeah. Some people were, you know, didn't make it to the other side. Some people made it to the other side and had an accident because they were overworked. So in the meantime, the human cost of this system is really, really high. And, in, and the discourse is, well, these sacrifices, we have to keep making them because this freedom will come eventually and everybody will be liberated. And to me, in this book, it's very much like, in the end, a kind of story that I heard once and it collapsed and now I'm hearing it again. It collapsed in 97, but because there was nothing else, it sort of kept reproducing itself. But for me, it really is a story of disillusionment and yeah. understanding that there's narratives and ideologies that pervade every system to keep it going. Okay, you live in London, but you go back to Albania now and then, and, and you think that there, uh, Albania is doing a bit better than in 1997? I mean, it's doing better for some people. I, I don't accept that it's, it's for the people for whom it's failing, it's failing. And those lives, they will not get back the, if they're failed, they're failed. They're not going to get back the time they wasted waiting. Okay. And so 
it's a bit like saying, well, we have to wait and it's going to get better for everyone. Yes, but in the meantime, for those who are there and who are not seeing the results of it, who die for various reasons, they are still lost. And yeah. I guess I see my role now as being critical of the system because I think that's only by being critical that you can raise awareness and you can encourage people to be active and to try yeah. and think about pushing forward for change. Okay, let me phrase the question differently. Compared to England, where you live, do you think there is not enough criticism in Albania uh, compared to England, like the, to the system we live in? The... Um, look, that's a good question, but I wouldn't say that in England there is a lot of criticism, actually. So I would say it's true that in Albania it's very unilateral and the discourse is very unilateral and the whole, for example, the EU stuff, the belief in the EU is ridiculous. It's almost like a religion. This is the new religion for change and so on. But on the other hand, in London, well, it's true, I'm in London and I teach at the LSE and I say these things at the LSE and so you might say, well, you're the example that you can say certain things. But if you actually look at the way the media works and the way in which the political system is sustained by media narratives and the kind of wider population and so on, it's not obvious to me that radical critiques of society really cut through in the mainstream discourse. I mean, there are for a few people who are already convinced before that will be convinced after, but it's not clear to me that discourse has this kind of power to really change things in a radical way or that, you know, if I go out and say these things, people will stop voting for stupid politicians and stop voting for Brexit and actually okay. start thinking about real emancipation. So okay. I guess I'm kind of, I'm not that convinced that, that there is, that the system is delivering okay. in terms of producing critical capacities in England, although in Albania it's failing for different ways, for different reasons in, in England, it's yeah. also failing. Okay. Maybe there's a question in the, in the audience. And I also have a question for the audience. Where are people who visited Albania in like the 80s or the 70s? Yes. Yes, I was in uh, Albania in, in uh, September 1990. And uh, it, it was probably the most uh, interesting, <laughs> probably the most uh, interesting experience in my life. And I remember something in the beginning, I didn't know why. Uh, they asked me how much money I wanted to change, and uh, I said about uh, 30 German marks. You don't need that, okay? Then, then, then 20. You don't need that. Now, now, then, then 15. Oh, okay. And then I got it. But uh, in Albania, I wanted to uh, to buy uh, a dictionary, and I thought I need more money. So how do I get more money? And I went to the Banca Estetit, and uh, it was very interesting and. Uh, uh, people said, are you hurried? Okay, go in front. So they were very friendly. Could you give us uh, your passport? And it was like a round uh, room. And one took the passport, gave it to another, and to another, and to another. And it disappeared for some time, and I was really afraid. <laughs> but it came back, and I became very beautiful banknotes, the, like art. And uh, <laughs> when, when I went out, I made a mistake I, I wouldn't make now. I counted it, and I heard something uh, say, "shoom," and then I knew. So, so, so they they, they wouldn't see such a, a lot of money. Uh, it, it means a, a lot, and uh, and so oh now I know why why they don't um, didn't want me to change uh, the money. But it was so beautiful, and the dictionary was uh, very cheap. And when I went back, it was forbidden to take the money back. Mm -hmm. and, but I wanted to smuggle it because it was so nice, and then uh, I hid it in the ashtray of the bus, and I was very afraid, because we all had to go out of the bus, and they would, would, would search, and then I had visions, so someone would come, was it you, was it you, was it you? <laughs> so, but there came no one, and I went back to the bus, and when we were over the Yugoslav border, I looked in the ashtray, and they were there, and I still have them. <laughs> 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 so you were 10 at the time, or yeah, 11. 1990, 10, uh, yeah. September 1990. Go ahead. I have uh, a question about uh, chapter 17. Uh, I read the book and I was so surprised that there is a Dutch <laughs> yeah, guy from the World Bank. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me something more about this Vincent van den Berg? I was, I was in an 
80s, 70s, even 80s and the 90s. So it's amazing to read uh, your book. But I was so curious, who's this Vincent van den Berg of the World Bank? Yeah. He's a, co a comic character. No, in no, the book. He, I mean, so he's a real character. He's a real character. It's his real name. Real. Oh, oh no, man. No, his yeah. real name Good is question. not that. Uh, I Sorry. actually I had the real name and then I changed it after some American lawyers who were publishing my American editions insisted that I should change, anonymize every name in the book that were not my family. So I had to anonymize him and, and change it. He was really Dutch and he was from The Hague, yeah. but he didn't think of himself as Dutch actually. He didn't actually care about the fact that he was Dutch. So he's, the story of him in the book is that he's a representative of the World Bank and he comes to Albania to help with delivering what was called structural reforms, which were these reforms that were meant to help Albania transition to liberalism. I think of him in the book as a kind of philosophical parallel to my teacher, Nora. Yes, you compare him with him. You they're say they, they have similarities. Yeah, they're, Tell a, us about they're it. in a kind of philosophical <laughs> dualism because she, they are both equally, they're both equally committed to the systems that they serve. And they're both missionaries, in a way, of the systems that they're in. So Nora is my moral education teacher. She's a committed socialist. And her job is to convince everyone that this is the right system we live in. And Van der Berg is equally committed to liberalism. He works for the World Bank, and he's come to help Albania transition to, to liberalism. The thing is that the fact that he's Dutch only matters to Albanians. It doesn't really matter to him, because he's, he's lived everywhere. He's a cosmopolitan. He lived in so many places that he doesn't even remember where he's been. And in fact, one of the peculiar characteristics of him, as I remember him and as I try to reconstruct it in a book, is that he's been in so many places that he doesn't remember their names. But what he does remember is every time you give him an experience from Albania that is unique or that you think is unique to you and your country or that is in some ways irreplaceable, he will always compare it to something that he's seen in some other part of the world. So he will say, <laughs> your dances remind me, your party Parties remind me of the parties in Ghana, and your burek will re reminds me of samosa, which is not spicy. And you know, your or, 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 or your the, the blackouts will remind me of all oh, we had. This, it Middle was East. much worse in Palestine. Yeah, we didn't that. even have bombs there. Yeah. So you don't even have bombs there. We had blackouts and bombs in the Middle East. And uh, he will have things like you know the Albanian village salads, which we call village salad, is actually Greek salad. So everything you give him which you think is unique to you as a country, he will compare it to something that he's seen in some other part of the world. And this is really troubling for the locals because it makes you feel really small and really irrelevant to the eyes of this kind of world citizen who has been everywhere and has seen everything. And you, there you are with your little country and your little things, your little dances and your little thongs that matter a lot to you. And you present them to him with his Let great pride and sense of honor. And he tells you yeah. it's actually... You know, not Let's not special. spoil this, but the, the villagers do take revenge, or the city, they're not villagers, they're exactly. city dwellers. I mean, they, manage, they manage eventually to kind of exasperate him, <laughs> because they invite him to a party, to the neighborhood no. party, and they kind of bring him so many things to eat, and they kind of tell him, you must try this, you must try that, and I had a lot of fun actually remembering all the menu in the, in the weddings <laughs> and stuff, so there's a lot of pages in which I talk about stuffed pe peppers, and fried feta, and chicken, and this and that, and kebabs, and so on. And eventually the man, at the end of the evening, gets so fed up with... And also they ask him a lot of questions. So they say, oh, you're from The Hague. So I have a cousin who lived in The Hague. His name was George, but actually he's called Joris over there. Do you actually meet... Do you know him by any chance? And Because he seems to know everything. So they ask him, do you Yeah, know but he don't remember cousin? names, which is quite telling. You know, <laughs> no, the people remember. are in the, you know, in, in, interchangeable for a communist and for a, a liberal like him. Yeah, right? so That's they invite... Exactly. So then they invite him to this party and they kind of offer him a lot. And then they ask him, are you married? Are you not married? Well, maybe you'll know an Albanian girl. Do you want me to introduce you to someone? And how old are you exactly? And where are your parents? And are they on, the, on their own? And why are they on their own? And you always leave your parents in an asylum somewhere. What All of these things. So he gets really fed up and then bangs his fist on the table and says, I am free. I <laughs> am free. I can do whatever I want. And then, Please stop force feeding me. And then he <laughs> runs to the back. is over. Yeah. Gerard, were there more of things in the book? You, you're an Albanian connoisseur. You're the Dutch Albanian connoisseur. You've, been, you, you've written a, a travel book uh, on Albania even in 1988, right? Uh, yeah, the first so, time uh, I was in Albania, I was in 1973, and I was a member of a communist, uh, Marxist Leninist uh, group called uh, MLPN or so, something, this, this Marxist Leninist groups. And then um, I um, uh, create, uh, I founded a kind of uh, association for Albania, a friendship association. And, uh, but uh, after 10 years, it was enough. I, I, was, I was not, you hear it? 
you can you hear it? Yeah. Uh, I was fed up and I was more concentrated in culture of Albania. So I, I read the book with a lot of pleasure because I, I recognize so much, especially it's about the 80s. Of course, you were born in 79, in the 80s and the 90s. So uh, this is also my experiences. I immediately after the fall of communism, I went to uh, to Albania in 94, I, uh, 94, I was in Albania, 94, 95, 96, I spent whole summers in Albania, of course not in 97, and uh, the only remark, it, the book is okay, uh, it, it's a pity that it stops in 97, I have only one remark to Peter, um, that there are more memoirs or histories uh, of Albanians in, translated into English, and the best book about the pyramid scheme this this year ninety seven is uh, Fatus Lubonja's yeah, book. Yeah, I read it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you must know it. I read it. I read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah you read it. Yeah. yeah, and also a book about uh, uh, Ornella Vorpsi. Um, yeah, Leah must know her. Yeah, That's the where no both ever... are in translated into English. Two books: Ornella Vorpsi, uh, the country where yeah, it's in English. The it's, it's, it's in Dutch, it's translated into Dutch. It's, in, in, uh, it's okay. a country where no one ever dies. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's translated into Dutch. So. Yeah, it's by uh, yeah. Van Oorschot. Yeah. 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 Yes, so it's, yes. It's, uh, that's that's okay, fiction. Okay, maybe uh, exaggerated a little bit. I know both uh, uh, books. I, I'm curious, one more question. Was there something in the book that was completely new for you? Um, it was what, surprised, what surprised me that she still has a kind of feeling a kind of nostalgia uh, to this this uh, society where everybody knew each other and there's a warm feeling. And to be honest, I have the same. I sometimes I'm I'm visiting. I'm now uh, re-writing uh, my travel guide of uh, city guide of Tirana, and uh, then I'm in the middle of the Skanderbeg Square. And then I have memories of the past in the 70s. There are pictures of, of that. Uh, uh, that, that time, and then you could see Daiti Mountain. It was completely empty. There were no skyscrapers. Uh, skyscrapers. So that, that's really, uh, and and I this this feeling of is really strange, but this feeling of um, oh uh, to to a, a period you really you know it's 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 maybe better now, but this this nostalgia to. It, it, I, couldn't, I could compare it with the 50s. I, I'm from 1950. I'm born in 1950. This time of the, that you didn't travel uh, abroad, that it was uh, a small society. Everybody knew each other. People were not. Uh, yeah, they, 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 they visited each other. They were not just watching their telephones. That, that nostalgia. That was for me a kind of. Uh, it's not not surprising, but that I like that. I liked it. Maybe you want to respond. Yeah, uh, so there is, uh, there is, you probably recognize, there is a chapter in the book in which I talk about the kinds of tourists that visited Albania. Yeah, that's, and yeah, I, and that's I think that probably sounded familiar to you because there really were of two kinds. So one were the kind of committed Marxist-Leninists who thought that social democracy was a disaster and Albania was a model of the future for every socialist in the world. A lot of Scandinavians, like, right? A lot of Scandinavians, yes. and, and, and from Holland, actually. And from Holland, yeah. But, uh, but Scandinavians especially, they were like, you know, what we have is horrible. The social democracy is just horrible. It's a crime, and we need Albania to kind of move forward. And they had this attitude that they got really enthusiastic about everything they saw in Albania. I have a sentence in the book which I think really was like that, that even the mosquitoes were exciting. Everything was like really exciting about Albania. They would like, even the way the mosquitoes would suck your blood was something heroic about it. They would it. wave at you all the time, waving, but, but you wouldn't really you. respond. We were, no, no, we weren't allowed to respond. So I remember my teacher, she told us like that tourists are very dangerous. The ones that will offer you bubble gum are the most dangerous of all. So never go close to the tourists she said, that offered, not the tourists in plural, the tourists, the category of the tourists, never go closer to the tourists that will give you bubble gum. So we always ran away when they pulled out the bubble gums, basically. Because ah. that's how they also, they approached us by showing us the bubble gums. So it really was a bit like, but being a bit like, because okay. we collected bubble gum wrappers, so that's yeah, why bubble I, gum was really priced. Can you explain a little bit yeah, about yeah, it? Because so we you wanted have, to have the wrappers, but yeah, maybe we, not exactly. from the so tourists. We didn't, have, like, okay. we didn't actually have bubble gums, and we wanted to have these wrappers. And usually, the wrappers had prices. There was a system of exchanging wrappers, but basically, at school, at school you, had ex you exchange them. Like, you could, I give you one boobabu, hubabu, but you give me two Wrigley Spearmints depending on how, you know, how exciting and how unusual was a bubblegum wrapper. But basically, 
one metric was Huba Buba and Wrigley Spearmint or whatever, but another metric that was really important was how fresh the bubblegum wrapper was, meaning how, how, long before, how long before the bubblegum had been in the wrapper. And you could usually know, because most of the bubblegum wrappers, they smelled like rubber and sweat. I could really close my eyes and smell it. it was, I really remember this very vividly. I was well, five, six, but this was like a very strong childhood memory. So most of them had this mixture of, of rubber and sweat, because they had been in so many hands and exchanged with them. But some of them, <laughs> but some of them were actually really um, fresh still, or not so fresh, but maybe. You could tell usually how old they were, like usually three months, two months, how, when the bubble gum came from the West or was given to the child, and then it could still have a little bit of the smell of the bubble gum, of the actual mint, for example. And so usually if it smelled of mint still, then even if it was, let's say, a Wrigley Spearmint, you could still swap it with one Huba Buba or something like that. And you you so. could recognize groups of tourists because you could smell the sun cream. Yeah, or that was, was the thing in soap? the Adriatic. Yeah. This yeah. Was, uh, yeah, the sun cream. So we didn't have sun cream. And the, the only tourists in, near my town, the Adriatic, uh, on the Adriatic coast, was one hotel where all the, all the tourists were sent. And there was a beach for the locals and a beach for the tourists. And there was a line in the sand. So usually you couldn't cross the line to go into the foreigners' beach. But in the sea, there was no line. So as a child, you could swim a little bit like deep and not be seen. And you could actually get quite close to the tourists. And usually there were tourist children who came and swam in, this, in front of the Adriatic. And they had this really unusual smell, which we could recognize. There was a tourist nearby because they smelled of sun cream. We didn't have sun cream, we only had olive oil. So we would kind of go next to them and smell them. And then sometimes it was really exciting, you would kind of follow them because you wanted to smell the sun cream. So you would kind of follow the tourists because they left behind this sun cream smell and, uh, and we followed them. Actually, interestingly enough, my mom's property, so my mom came from this very rich property owning family before communism and she was expropriated. And her house, where she, her grandfather had bought this villa, right next to this very famous hotel that was for tourists, the Adriatic. So the house right next to the Adriatic used to belong to her family. And so when she had it back in the 90s, I remember, they went and they were just given the keys to this property. They went back and this is where they used to spy on the tourists from their house. So all they found was these wires and left abandoned spying devices. Because the secret service. Because yeah. of the secret service. So that had been the kind of the unit where, so my mom basically all her life, we all our lives bathed in front of her parents' house, which was used to spy the tourists. And I never knew that this was actually her parents' house until the house was given to us in 1990 and we went to turn it into a villa and it's still there and they're yeah. still using it. So, yeah. uh, is somebody else in the audience who, yeah, the lady in the middle. Yes. Um, just, uh, came back last week from Albania for, uh, we were there 11 days uh, with a very nice group and an Albanian woman who was the guide. But what uh, we were very astonished, uh, and actually I was, that there were so many cars, beautiful cars, Mercedes all over the way. And then we hear it is a very poor country. And I was wondering where people, normal people live how how they get their income from what? Yeah, when were you in Albania? Uh, a few years just ago. Just now. Oh, just now, just now, just, just when now I was there. Last okay. Week, we came back last week. Yeah. For 11 days. Oh, you were more recent than I. And yeah. we were. It was very nice because we had an Albanian guide, a woman who already lived for 25 years in in the Holland, and uh, Rudi Kari. I don't know if you know him. He wrote about Albania already. Uh, Many books, oh, in any case, one book, so uh, we had very nice guides. But uh, that was the question. Yeah, the question was, well, what, how do they make their living? Well, uh, so we come to Albania now, maybe that's fine. So, uh, yeah. Well, you, I mean, you, you have been to Albania answer. more recently than yeah. I have. You, know, so <laughs> you were told, I, uh, my sense is that the rich Albanians are in Tirana and Duras and the kind of the main towns. And then there's a lot of people scattered in the neighborhoods and either, you know, they don't make a living and leave, try to leave the country or, or go, or they're employed in this kind of precarious or they work for the rich Albanians. My family is now very wealthy. My mom's very wealthy because she had a lot of properties back. And so there's quite a few. And she Albanians. sold them to an Arab Yeah, she sold them to an Arab Arabian. developer yeah. after we, when I was old and yeah. I didn't need her money anymore. But basically, anyway, yeah. she, she got her properties back and made her money back. And so she's wealthy and comfortable and she employs lots of these Albanians that you wonder what they do. I mean, they work for people like my mother and on very precarious jobs and on 
I think really, really, actually very, very hard circumstances, earning very little, and I don't think really represented actually in the Albanian political system because the story is that, you know, the government is doing great, which it's true, it's doing good things and it's modernizing and so on. But I really feel that there is a whole category of Albanians that is completely dis disenfranchised and completely unrepresented and just the system is just not working for them. <laughs> Well, well, well. No, the, no, there is a bit of, the, of there is a bit of that. There is. Yeah, and there is a, a, a great. Uh, maybe I should be the one to break this. Uh, there is a great uh, trade in cocaine from Colombia to England, and in England there are a lot of Albanians who are involved. I'm not saying that's bad because the English people are snoring it, so I'm not blaming here anybody. So there's coming some money in the country uh, uh, in that way. Um, and you prob it's probably only spent in Tirana, so it's probably where you saw it, because it's not the whole economy, of course. Uh, for the rest, there's uh, agriculture. Uh, we, have, uh, Giro, we have all kinds of uh, uh, agriculture in Albania. It's not as efficient as here. Yeah, but uh, I was also very surprised with that in the first few weeks I was there. Uh, then I sent pictures to the car, uh, the guy who reviews cars for NRC Handelsblad. Mark sitting here, he can testify that he's called Bas van Putten. And uh, so I sent the pictures and said, well, isn't this a great car? I don't even have a driving license, so I have no clue. But isn't this a great car? And he said, well, there's 300,000 on the meter, I'm sure. So, and, and he would always, uh, like... Um, Oh, relatively uh, uh, marginalize my excitement about these cars. Apparently, they're not all that great as you think, but it's true that Albanians love BMWs and Mercedes yeah, cars. That's true. So they look all pretty fancy, but apparently, they're not all that great as I and you think as uh, visitors to the country. Um, it is, of course, uh, yeah, it's not a country, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's. Uh, um, so there was a Dutch television program, a lady who is a police officer who goes to different countries, and she was very much amazed by this, and she was especially amazed that the police never stopped those cars. But that, that are all, that are com complicated issues, they have not much to do with your memoirs that stopped in 1997. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, would, I will not say it's a country in transition, I promise. <laughs> that would be... I mean, it is, it uh, is in transition. It's but, just that nobody knows where it's transitioning to. But yeah, yeah it is in transition. There is, <laughs> it's just no, transitioning no, to something. Yeah. <laughs> just, no, every country, every country is in transition. Right, so exactly. that, no, no, I will not say that. That's I, I exactly. think that's, that, that's a... Yeah, we're in transition uh, here. Yeah, we're well. all in transition. Right? Exactly. No, uh, it's more that, yeah, there, there are different ways of or, uh, organizing the economy, let's say that way. And, uh, and I think Leah is absolutely right in it is an issue that uh, a great number of Albanians don't see much future in their own country. So they leave the country, or they want to leave the country, or they are working on leaving the country. My 15-year-old uh, daughter, she was 12 when she arrived in Albania, she got a very good friends, Albanian friends, who spoke English perfectly, better than I do, and they're 12 years old. So they're already at that age, like thinking about their transition <laughs> and their future that lay, lays in the country where they speak English and working on that. So uh, in that aspect, um, th yeah, they, it's, uh, there is, that is quite sad for a country when everybody wants to leave. But there are also wonderful things for Albania. Yeah. 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 Like in the many, maybe you, uh, sorry, uh, maybe not a question. Yeah, 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 so it seems uh, very logical. A lot of Albanians are going to Canada and the U.S. and even here. Well, most of them are going to Greece. Greece and Italy, then Germany, and in the end you get also some people go to Canada and America. You will be surprised how many people are living in North America. Yeah. Albanians. Yeah, yeah, there's an Albanian... Uh, there's a lot uh, of society. them. But so, that's a bit complicated. I went into these numbers because I'm also writing about Albania. Many of them left the country way before the 90s, the ones in America. Mm -hmm. They are from another group of Albanians, but yeah, they are everywhere, and they have reason to leave their country. So I agree with you. I'm married to an Albanian uh, ah. woman, so she's living okay. here, obviously, but her sister is living in, in Toronto, Canada. Yeah. Her other sister is living in, in Thessaloniki, Greece. Yeah. So the f f three out of four children yeah. of my parents-in-law yeah. are living abroad. Mm. Yeah, and absolutely understandable. Right? I mean, yeah. yeah, we can understand. I mean, they also, they, the, so the way they get to the U.S. and Canada is by applying, which is another very curious and interesting thing. They apply for this American lottery, for example. Yeah. And 
they all apply for the American lottery, regardless of whether they want to go or not. And then when the lottery comes up, they feel like they can't say no to the lottery because you've been you won by the lottery. You won the lottery. And so I know yep. a lot of Albanians who actually left everything they had in Albania just because the lottery came through. And they had no intention of going. They just applied for the There's lottery. There's no country in the world. Sorry. To be honest, yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I know people who were very high up in the government, for example, in Albania, who won the lottery for Canada and are now doing kind of mid-level employee in the oh, bank yeah, and, yeah. you know. But, you know, if, if, if you don't have any work, if you don't... Have yeah, sure. No, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. come Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree with that. don't have any opportunity. So all the people I've met who left the country, they have a better life mm. as if they stay there. Yeah. And, and uh, just to talk about the book again, uh, the, the, the family is only wealthy after getting these properties back and selling it. Your yeah. mom also cleaned toilets in Italy, yeah, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, but yeah. Still, if, if yeah, yeah, nowadays you're right. But the, 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 the family has a certain background, also in, in intellectually and, and yeah. so forth. I mean, it's not a, a moderate Albanian family, I understand. That's the way I perceive it. Yeah, but it does something with pride and honor if when you're abroad, maybe not the, ne the next generation, but the first generation, they are employed in Greece and Italy, uh, seriously in the numbers is like almost all of them is mainly about Italy and Greece mm -hmm. and they having the lowest jobs in those countries. Yeah. And yes, they probably are better off there. I mean, materially uh, wise nowadays in these days. No, not, not only way of living and uh, for instance that. my my wife but also my my two sisters in law they they never want to go back to albania whatever happens so um they perceive their home country as not very positively to be honest are you optimistic or pessimistic to get to your point? Eh? Optimistic, optimistic or pessimistic about the future of albania okay so I'm going to say I'm always optimistic about the future of everything, but that's because, but that's because I'm a very optimistic person. But I'll tell you under what, like, what are the, what is my optimism? What does it consist of? So I'm optimistic, but because I never base my optimism on looking around and thinking, do I have grounds to be optimistic or pessimistic? Like, I never make these assessments to decide whether optimism or pessimism is warranted. Let's say. So I feel like. We always have a duty to be optimistic because if you're not optimistic, then why do you do things? Why do you move forward? Why do you try and why change things? Up. Why you wake up? You can't be not optimistic. I mean, what does, how do you live without being optimistic? <laughs> why do you even live if you're not optimistic? So, so this is why I'm always optimistic. Thank you. We got to a good uh, answer. Yeah, uh, I'm there, always yeah. optimistic yeah. and I always have hope. But because for me, having hope is like a moral duty. It's not about seeing the world and deciding does it actually justify my hope or not. I think it's just not the right way. Okay, then let me rephrase the question. How was your last visit to Albania? What did you think of what you saw? This is not about the book, because the book stops in 97, so we shouldn't talk about it too long. But um, Okay, so I see a lot of things that I'm supposed to think are great, and I guess I think they are good. I see more roads, and I see more development, and I see more initiative, and more, inve more wealth in some ways, and so on. But I also see a lot of misery, actually. And I notice that I see a lot of misery that other people just either don't see or they're used to not seeing it. Or I mean, so I see these construction workers. And I read in the news that there is a construction worker that dies there and, or that there is someone in the mine who has just had an accident or whatever. And I feel like there's all these facts that kind of really shake me because I think, well, these are deaths much. just like dying in, in the communist prison is a death. And, you know, if you die working on a flat because you're on working extra hours or you're not being paid enough and you need to work three jobs or whatever, that is also a death that is caused yeah. by a system or a structure, let's say. So I get really troubled by these accidental deaths, I suppose, and deaths and labor deaths and so on, which I'm not saying, you know, they're not massive, but they are there. And every single one of them really weighs on me. And I also see that there are people like my family that have a lot of privilege and, and enjoy it without feeling responsible for other people and yeah. just kind of think, well, everybody does that. I also see a lot of young people that all they care about is brands. I don't know if you had this experience in Tirana, but I just find it shocking that 
you and know, the, the selfie brands, yeah, well. or the who got boss or whatever, like you know, wearing certain clothes and having these signed things and having this kind of luxury goods from the West or having these holidays and telling you I was in this yacht somewhere and I was with this business. So just the way in which wealth has become a value in itself and all these things, I guess, as someone who goes there from the outside. They make me feel really sad because I think this is not what I don't think these are real it's values, and I don't think this is really life worth. And, yeah. and but what makes me even more sad is the fact that people seem used to it and not care about the fact that it's there, that the younger people people want this, and yeah. So I guess this is why it's a kind of mixed yep. assessment of I guess Albanian reality. Yep. So I see some things that are good and some developments that are, you know, some schools that have been built and uh, hospitals that are kind of the, they manage the pandemic relatively well compared to other countries and so on. But then you also see these other horrible things going on. And I can't just turn an eye and say, well, because this is great, I now need to say, well, this is a cost of transition, I suppose. Maybe, yeah. maybe we should go to the last or almost the last question. Uh, anybody in the audience? Yes, in the back. Um, a reluctant question. Reluctant question. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't help but, but think that your, your parents must have done something right listening to you. Um, <laughs> and I, I wonder how they reflect on their uh, secretive uh, behavior later in life. Yeah, good question. Good question. And maybe I can add to that. This question also, you promised your father, I, he's not around anymore, I know, but you promised him, he was so disappointed that you wanted to study philosophy, he would uh, say, do at least something like physics, something that, that, you know, that helps the world and helps you, and not all this talking, and he meant to say, stay away from Marx, yeah. not Marxism again. That's true. And you promised him yeah. to stay away from Marx, and now, the last time I checked, you're giving classes on Marx, right? Yeah. So... First, his question, and, and maybe you could uh, elaborate on that, and uh, including yeah. this one. How do, your question was, how do they uh, uh, look at? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. On. So, how did they reflect on the on the secrets? I think they felt that they had no other choice, and that they did it to protect me. And I think they succeeded. And I think they were right. They convinced me that they did this for my sake. I, it was otherwise a really loving family. I had an amazing relationship with my grandmother, especially. She was really my kind of orientation in the world. She kind of taught me how to live in a way. And so, and because I had this incredible trust in her, I took on and I absorbed all these transitions in my personal kind of coming of age, as it were. The book is a kind of coming it of is age a story. Of yes, so yes, it is. There were all these crises, but she helped me overcome them and sort of she helped me navigate my identity and try and bring together. And this book also really helped me bring together all these different pieces of my childhood and so on. About my father's and my kind of Marxism stuff, I also, my mom, my, mom, my father doesn't live anymore. So, and my grandmother also doesn't live anymore. And they never really see me. My dad saw me study philosophy, but he didn't really see me kind of take an interest, active interest in Marxism in the way in which I ended up doing just before <laughs> so you did I wrote this him. book. Okay. I didn't, no, just no, before different. this book, I was going in a more and more, in, I had my, my theoretical, and this was part of the reason for writing the book, was that I become more and more interested in Marxism, but not just Marxism as a philosophy, but the politics of Marxism. So if you have these commitments and if you believe in this critique of capitalism and so on, what follows from it politically? What kind of society does it create? How does it think about democracy and so on? And my mother was horrified because she was always right-wing and libertarian. And in a book, I talk about her idea of freedom, which was a very classical, I guess, liberal idea of freedom. And she was always telling me, like, how come you study Marx? And why are you interested in Marx? And how can you kind of be, how can you care about this stuff? And at the beginning, it made me really uncomfortable because I, I knew why she was asking this question and I knew what she had in mind. And, you know, there were all these deaths in the family and these persecuted people who had spent years in prison and so on. So it was very hard for me. But then on the other hand, I thought about this, and my grandfather, the one who went to prison in Albania for 15 years, he went because he was a socialist, and he had been in a popular front, in, he'd been kind of involved, he studied... The social France. democrat. He was a social democrat, Sorry, but yeah. a, a social democrat of the 30s yeah. was like, you know, yeah. way to the left of a yeah. social democrat now. Yeah, but just to... Uh, yeah. <laughs> so a social democrat in the 30s was yeah. a real principal social democrat. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, yeah. not a labor guy. Not now a labor. was not like a kind of no. le left of liberalism, let's no. say. Yeah. So there was a real difference. And in fact, I know this because when I was writing the book, and I'm also thinking about my next book project, I went through a lot of his prison notes. He was reading books and doing these translations in prison, and some of these notes we still have. And in prison, he was reading like the social history of art and all this kind of literature with a social purpose. He was really into Zola and kind of a literature that has these things about human emancipation and socialism and so on. And in fact, part of the reason for writing with this book and having my commitments, I feel that there is a story, in a way, the kind of the 
the story of the 20th century is obviously a story of the left against capitalism and a story of the left against liberalism and so on. But a lot of it is about internal wars within the left and the kind of the left killing a part of itself, yeah. kind of. Yeah. And you know, Soviet uh, communism was some of that, and Stalinism obviously was some of that. And there were as many victims of Stalin that were actually syndicalists from Spain were, or yeah, all or kinds Trotsky or whatever. Really like you know, all this kind of there was all this left that was suppressed by the state socialist left. And I feel also in the 90s there was a part of the dissident movement movement that moved, that mobilized against this kind of state socialist societies that weren't in favor of capitalism. What they wanted was to democratize their societies and to kind of make these societies live up to their commitments and to have freedom of expression, freedom of thought and so on. So there was a story that you could tell about the left in these countries, which was about a left that was suppressed by the socialist left, but that was still recognizably left and recognizably socialist because it believed in a certain critique yeah. of capitalism and it took seriously these commitments and so on. So, when, I, when my mother asked this question, I kind of, at first I was perplexed, and then I thought, well, look, I mean, my grandfather was a socialist. He spent 15 years in prison. And, you know, I have a kind of duty to think about what he was thinking and to care about what he was caring if I find it's plausible and to kind of engage with the world in a way that he, wanted, he would have wanted me to engage with the world, as opposed to saying, oh, well, you believed in these things. You ended up 15 years in prison. Your life was ruined. Fine, things have now changed, and we just adapt to the kind of liberal world that we have. And I find that sort of not a very satisfying stance. And I guess I see myself as continuing on the line of these commitments, of this and not necessarily as like, what is this schizophrenic outlier who's just you know, suddenly <laughs> discovered the greatest of Marx and has almost this kind of Stockholm syndrome and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> lived under communism, <laughs> thinks it was great, and now wants to kind of bring it back. I don't think it's that. It's not that I have any nostalgia for the system. It's just that I feel in, every, in each of the systems there were certain commitments that are worth reviving and thinking about what they were and to kind of separate yeah. the good and the bad and have a more nuanced approach, I guess, to yeah. history. So it was a very good question, thanks. I, I also want to add uh, in, the, in the end of this uh, talk that I wanted to bring out this anecdote. So I, I did and we talked about But the book is also written by a, a professor of political philosophy, right? So you get a, a lot of ideas about what freedom is and what freedom is for different people. Um, actually also within this anecdote. So I, I found it remarkable how you do that. Uh, so I'm, I'm uh, once again, I really uh, advise everybody to read it in Dutch or English, doesn't matter. In Albanian, about a few weeks' time, right? Written by yourself, translated by yourself. Yep, yep. Uh, and um, once again, it's a fabulous, uh, enticing, and uh, very yeah, wonderful book. Tantalizing, maybe that's the word. Um, thank you very much for coming. Thank you all for coming. Um, I don't know if you want to get the floor to <laughs> finish off. And let's Leah and Peter for this uh, amazing talk and uh, I think everyone uh, is very inspired now. Um, if you haven't done so, the book is uh, being sold in the back and I'm sure Leah is willing to sign if you uh, would, have, would like to have a signature in, in your, uh, in your uh, book. So thank you all for coming and uh, hope to see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.